so welcome to Type Theory session. Uh, thanks for coming to the session. I know it's a little bit challenging, you know, after drinking lots of beer yesterday and after staying up until late. Uh, thanks for joining uh, Type Theory session. Um, so my name is Hanali. I'm from Brazil. I work for a company called Codeminer42. Uh, those are some of my hobbies during my free time. Uh, I like Pokemon, so if you're playing Pokemon, I see some people with Nintendo 3DS. If you're playing Pokemon, let's change Pokemon. Uh, please. Uh, I also like GIFs, and for this reason, there, there are going to be lots of GIFs on this presentation, and I hope this uh, helps you to stay awake in this amazing morning after party. Uh, so I guess you were wondering, why type theory? Um, it's really loud, isn't it? I can hear the echo. It's too much technology for me. I have a better plan. Hi. Hi. It's, is it better? All right. Can you hear me okay? It's much better now. Sorry. Uh, so I had the chance to give this session uh, in different formats in other conferences, and people's expectations were kind of very different. Some of them, they wanted to learn, like, what the hell is that? Uh, or other people, they knew a little bit about language theory, and they wanted to understand the connection between programming and mathematics. But why are you here? I mean, I, I know there are other different sessions that you could be attending, sessions about um, frameworks, libraries, and other things. But uh, have you ever asked yourselves, uh, what are the boundaries of computer science? I mean. There is, there is a limit where you don't even know what to ask because people are trying to you know, uh, reach the boundaries of knowledge. And type theory, uh, I personally consider that and other, other students, other PhD students also consider that, um, is one of the boundaries of computer science. And that's why this topic is very attractive to me and maybe this topic um, turns into an attra attractive topic to you as well. Uh, so, we need theory in order to build fast and efficient tools, tools that we use in our working day, like frameworks and libraries. So, we need some theory uh, in order to improve these tools, and that's why uh, type theory is a trending topic. It's a very important topic. Uh, so, there is this beautiful definition from Wikipedia. Uh, in mathematics, logic, and computer science, a type theory is in, is in of a class of formal systems, some of which can serve as alternatives to set theory as a foundation for all mathematics. In type theory, every term has a type and operations are restricted to terms of a certain type. That, that means lots of things, like, please. Uh, so, sometimes you're trying to learn a uh, certain theory, but you kind of read the definition, but it doesn't make any sense. And I guess that's the case for, for type theory. Like, what does it even mean? Um, so sometimes asking Wikipedia is not that efficient. So I hope this session helps you to understand what that content that we saw in the previous slide actually mean. And, and hopefully, you will understand how to make a good use of that. A quick disclaimer before we get started. We only have 50 minutes. Uh, we have lots of theory and mathematics, uh, but don't be scared. It's not going to hurt that much, no harms. Uh, we are not going to see anything advanced, so if you, if you have been working with type theory before, maybe the session is not for you, because as the title says, uh, this is for complete beginners. Uh, we're going to see some GIFs, as I also mentioned, uh, because that's interesting and I like GIFs. Uh, and it really helps people to stay awake. Uh, so our goals here is understanding what type theory is about, uh, and we also have to understand how can we jump from code to mathematics. I hope by the end of the session, uh, we are all able to understand the steps that we need to follow in order to get a piece of code and be able to analyze it in terms of mathematics. Uh, and of course, let's understand why type theory is a boundary in computer science and why it's so important. So this is our quick agenda, and let's start talking about how do we actually choose a programming language. 
how many of you work with Java? Lots of hands. How many of you work with any other language besides JavaScript? How do you choose a programming language? Please, someone talk to me. Depends on the task. Uh, do you choose it because your company wants to? Maybe. Sometimes you're forced to use a certain language because that's the language that your company adopts, because it's popular, or because your particular team wants to try something with that language, maybe Go, maybe Ruby, maybe Python. Uh, sometimes you have a deadline to reach, and you have to choose the language that you're faster to deliver, right? So sometimes you choose something Java, not because Java would be more appropriate, but that's because you know Java. Uh, sometimes someone tells you, hey, you, do you know anything about Dart? Everyone is using Dart. I don't know if this is true. I don't think it is. But y you should also use Dart. And then the person is so uh, persuasive that you end up adopting the language. I don't know. Uh, you really don't know why you're using that language. I don't know. I, I, you arrive at the company and everybody's using that and you think that's the best solution and then you just start using the language. But how often do you consider the following topics to adopt a new language for your project? How often do you consider the type system, immutability, uh, the paradigm, uh, how much verbals the language is? How often do you consider these terms? Always. Sometimes. Never. I don't know what type, what type system is. Uh, so those are also important topics to consider and sometimes people don't realize that uh, they are going to influence your final architecture. Uh, so what is a type system? If you said yes always to this previous slide, what's the meaning of type system in a concise way? Come on. You, can, you should be able to explain Errors at compile time only? Well, not really. So see, that's a tricky question. And this is one of those terms that everyone is talking about, but very few people are actually able to uh, synthesize the meaning of that in a short sentence. And that's tricky. So when you have a term or concept that everyone is talking about, but you don't seem to be able to explain to someone that's not related to programming what's the meaning of that, you should reconsider restudying the topic and revisiting the principles of it. So again, let's ask Wikipedia. What are you expecting here? A meaningful sentence or something like that? Something amazing like that. In programming languages, a type system is a collection of rules that assign a property called type to various constructs a computer program consists of, such as variables, expressions, and functions and, or modules. So that is kind of relevant, explains lots of things, so we can go to the next topic. No, <laughs> we can't. What's the meaning of that? Again, we reached another definition that actually means nothing in terms of you know, practical development, right? Do you agree? So let's see what's the real meaning of that. So for all languages, including assembly or other uh, languages that you can consider, we have at least two components, data and operations, right? For all programming languages. Uh, but not all of the available operations make sense to all kinds of data, right? Is there any sense, I don't know, in performing a sum into, I don't know, something that you can actually, that you can't actually count? Does it make sense? Sometimes not. So that's the meaning of that. Uh, not all available operations make sense to all kinds of data. Uh, and if you try to match in incompatible pieces of data for a certain operation, you may have a representation error. So the, the, our friend there just mentioned like it's about compile errors, but not about compiling errors, because not all languages are compiled, right? So it's more about representation error. So uh, a type system, is the idea of looking at a program and determine if a representation error will happen or not. So not necessarily for compile or for uh, interpreted languages, but it's about representation errors and saying this, there's going to be an error or not, right? So that's the idea of a type system. So to, in order to determine this representation error, you have to come up with a strategy uh, to handle these representation errors, right? 
And you can come up with several different strategies. For example, uh, if the language is compiled, you can generate generates a compile error, right? So that happens for Java, for example. Uh, you can perform some sort, some sort of check in your code, and then you can have a well-defined error set. Uh, for Java, for example, we have exceptions, and then you can throw this kind of exception, right? That's a way to you know, define a representation error. Or you can have a totally unpredictable um, error set, and you can try some implicit conversions. So for example, if, if you are familiar with JavaScript, what happens if you try to sum an integer with a character? Do you have an error? Come on, JavaScript people. I don't know. N-A-N. What happens? I mean, does JavaScript block you? No, it doesn't block you. That was the error set, but uh, it tries to convert. So it doesn't block you. It actually tries to convert, even if it doesn't make any sense. So JavaScript tries to come up with a solution on the fly, even if it doesn't make any sense. And that's also a valid strategy to handle representation errors. Uh, so I don't know. You, uh, you can come up with a compil compiler that tags pieces of your code and tries to infer uh, the behavior uh, of that piece of code. And it, the compiler also tries to determine if it's valid or not. Or you can have a compiler or interpreter uh, that generates more code to keep track of the code that you're writing. And that's also a valid strategy, right? <coughs> so for each of these strategies, uh, people like to add names of it, right? So for the first one that we mentioned, generating a compiler error in a well-defined error set, it's what we call strong typing. Or on the other hand, if uh, the compiler or interpreter tries to do something with pieces of data that doesn't make any sense, we call this weak. Um, and the same way, you have static and dynamic. So those are labels for strategies that we use in order to handle representation errors. Um, we don't have to choose an alternative. Oh, I'm, I'm missing a slide here. I can also choose uh, another good strategy. I don't care. Do nothing. And that's what assembly does. That's why assembly is difficult, because assembly is not going to help you to handle any kind of representation errors. Assembly is the type of language that we call uh, untyped. So you don't do anything for representation errors. Uh, you don't have to choose a single alternative. You can choose more than one alternative. So for example, uh, Java is a static and strong, some, somewhat strong. Python, for example, is dynamic. JavaScript, for example, is weak, right? In terms, we can try to categorize each language based on the strategy that the language adopts to handle most of the errors. Um, so can we perform uh, the, typo, the, the, the type check mentioned before? So is Java strong? Yes, people say Java is strong, but is Java strong for every case? No. How do we know that? How do we determine that? So that's the idea. In order to categorize a language for a certain type, you have to be assertive, right? The same way you're assert assertive saying 2 plus 2 equals 4, you have to be assertive for um, the ideas that you try to pass uh, to a certain language. So how can we prove this statements. So type theory is also about proving statements in a precise way. We need some mathematics in order to come up with precise statements, right? Mathematics has been proven to be a good tool if you, we want to, to show that we are right or that some, someone else is wrong, right? That's why you need mathematics. So by the end of the session, hopefully, we'll be able to understand what's the meaning of this weird thing on the screen. Don't be afraid. That's not that difficult, I promise you. Don't be like that. Um, so uh, let's try to sketch uh, some steps for understanding the meaning of the previous uh, sentence that I just showed to you. So the first thing in order to uh, do a deep analysis of the type system of a language, uh, you try to collect the keywords that you have available in the grammar and you try um, 
to understand how they work uh, individually. So for example, in Java, uh, you have a bunch of keywords, right? You have extend, you have implement, you have throws, so you have a bunch of keywords. And in which context do you actually use the word extends? You always use extends for another class, another class type, right? Either a class that you created or either a class that you just um, borrowed uh, from another package, right? Uh, the same thing for interface, for implement, but implements is for interfaces. It's easy to get idea, right? So you do some sort of sketch where you map the keywords and the context that you're actually using these keywords, and that's not that difficult. Uh, so people from mathematics, they like to replace uh, long, long words and sentences with Greek letters, just because it's, I don't know, or letters, just because it's interesting, and it's shorter, right? So we can actually save paper or screen size or whatever. Um, and they, people from mathematics also prefer Greek letters instead of you know, Latin letters, I don't know. Uh, so we did this mapping of the context that we have to a Greek letter. Is it clear? Is everyone alive up to here? Yeah, no, not that difficult. All right, uh, so after we do this mapping, we try to group these results uh, and remove the duplicates. So for example, more than a keyword in Java actually involves a class type, right? More than a keyword in Java involves, I don't know, throw or whatever. So we try to come up with uh, different groups for each of these keywords that we just mapped. And a difficult task in science is actually mapping, uh, sorry, is actually grouping topics because uh, different people can come up with different groupings. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, a possible grouping for Java, uh, but there is, a, of course, there's more than one possible way to do it. Uh, once we do this grouping, uh, we try to use symbolic logic to simplify our final result. So for example, uh, given the keywords that we have in Java, um, we can try to come up with a result type, and a result type can be a type that, the, uh, that I personally defined or nothing, right? The same thing for type. A type can be primitive or a reference, right? Those are the two possible uh, things that I can have in Java. Is it clear up to here? I try to, do, I try to turn this into a concise piece, right? Um, the mathematicians like this interesting symbol uh, to be representing the definition symbol. Um, and I can do that for other parts of my code. So in Java, for example, uh, I have arguments. An argument can be an actual parameter or no, right? So I, I have to come up with this, uh, this little set based on my analysis of all possible things that I can do based on the language grammar. Is it clear up to here? And is it clear that I can come up with a different grouping? This grouping makes sense to me, but other people can come up with different solutions, right? So this has to be clear. Um, so every program in Java uh, has its set of classes and variables. Do you remember the first slide where I say that I have data and operations? So in Java, we have um, classes and variables. Uh, and for a program, uh, Comp composed by uh, classes and variables, we call this environment. So we have, the same way you have functions in mathematics and you have the domain of a function, we have to be precise about the domain that we're talking about, right? So for Java, for example, we know that for a single application, we are going to have the main method running our code, right? Or we are going to have a server that actually has a main method somewhere running a piece of code or a thread or anything, right? Uh, so that's why in, in the following slides we're going to see this Greek letter here uh, mentioning an environment. So in a Java environment, I have a group of classes, right, and a group of interfaces. Does it make sense? Yeah. Uh, so starting from there, I can um, come up with some derivations of what I'm trying to uh, turn into mathematics. So what is the meaning of a, a class map? Well, a class map is a bunch of classes of a certain type, 
And these classes are going to have a declaration, either written by me or someone else, right? The same thing for interfaces, right? And uh, we use this symbol here, this M, uh, to illustrate that there is a mapping, right? Was it too difficult? Are you alive? Say yes. Yes. We are almost there. Uh, so, do you remember that table that we did for, I'll go back a little bit here, this table here that we did for um, our um, summary of types that we have in Java? Now we have to come up with the same type of declaration for all the types. So in an environment, I have classes and interfaces. What is a class map? Well, it's a bunch of class type that have a class declaration, the same thing for interfaces. But again, what's the meaning of class decla declaration? So we have to keep expanding all these terms, right? And that's pretty, pretty much the idea of logic. Do you remember, how many of you had the logic as a topic in college or high school? Lots of people here. So do you remember that in logic, if you come with an expression that you can simplify, you have to keep opening it until you have true or false, and that's our goal here, right? So I have to keep opening these terms, and then not only symbolic logic matters, but we need predicate logic. To remember, there was a difference between symbolic and predicate logic. Symbolic logic is some sort of uh, simple way to understand what, what is going on in a logic system. But if you need to add more, comple more complexity or an environment around your um, logic variables, you actually need predicate logic, right? So you need something a little, some, some, some tool, some mathematical tool a little bit better. So we need to use predicate logic to actually analyze what's going on inside our environments because with predicate logic, you can insert a context for a certain variable. And that's exactly what happens in a program, right? Um, so we can start building statements, well-formed statements with predicate logic. So an example in Java. Uh, we know that a valid type in Java is something that's true. Whatever it is, a variable or a class that I declared, it's something that is going to end up in true. So for example, uh, is primitive a valid type? Yes, we know it is. Um, so we can simplify this statement, and again, replacing this primitive to a Greek letter, right? Um, so a primitive in an environment is also true, right? So we have to write this in terms of a predicate logic, right? We, we are providing the context. So everything that we map it here, all these declarations that we have here, now we have to analyze them with a context. That's why we are using predicate logic. Does it make sense? And this is, exact, this is exactly what happens in our code, right? We have variables and definitions or types inside a certain context, right? Uh, so we have to get all the pieces that we just expanded the declaration and provide a context that is valid. That's going to be very helpful for any statement that we try to prove in the future, right? Okay, so I agree for you, breathe. Uh, now it's the difficult part. Lots of people ask, but how can I come up with these statements from the top of my head? Of course, some of them, they are pretty much straightforward, like an environment, a primitive variable in an environment, of course, this is a valid statement. But we have this tool here called Lambda Calculus that actually help us to come up with these statements. So saying like, I don't know, uh, does Java have subtyping? So Lambda Calculus, is the, is the character who is going to help us to come up with uh, interesting statements and then say if, if these statements are true or not, okay? Lambda calculus, unfortunately, it's a very uh, long topic and it's out of scope of this presentation. I'm going to leave you some references. I also have a small, uh, a small uh, presentation about lambda calculus if you're interested, but it's important to understand that this is the key for building uh, some statements. Um, this is also an interesting uh, reference uh, for, I don't know, this is um, way m a little bit a more uh, elaborated content, so you can check it out. Um, so with Lambda Calculus, we can define 
what is this thing that we're trying to map as a type? This is going to be very helpful here, right? Um, so with lambda calculus, we can transform function, functions, uh, sorry, functions can actually transform data. And that's the idea here. So if you get a declaration in Java, I don't know, public integer uh, next int, which is a function, what are the components here? Well, we have the idea of the type integer, right? So let's call it A. Again, transforming uh, the types that are having letters, right? Uh, and we are trying to transform, we are inputting an integer and we are outputting an integer, right? So this function actually is transforming integers to integers. Can you have other types of functions? A function that transform, transforms integer to doubles or integers to real numbers or whatever? Yes, and it's important to um, start doing this kind of mapping, right? Can you have um, a class called person uh, and a class called uh, employee and employee, uh, sorry, employee extends person? And then can you have a function that uh, inputs an employee and delivers a person? Can you have such a thing? Yes, so that's, in, that's important to map all the types that you have in the language and all the types that you have in your own program, right? That's the idea of mapping types. Is it clear up, up to here? Right? Uh, so again, in Lambda Calculus, we don't use this cute representation, which for me is kind of intuitive. Uh, the same thing uh, can be expressed with this amazing uh, Lambda function, right? Uh, so this, way, this, which also means this previous statement, looks like more mathematics. That's the only difference. They mean the same thing, what you're inputting and what you're outputting, right? But they, act, they, they, they mean the same thing. Uh, but just looks more like mathematics. So, uh, with Lambda Calculus, uh, we get some extra help to build uh, this statement. And this looks like predicate logics. That's the idea of Lambda Calculus for analyzing a certain uh, code. So finally, you can come up with your own statement. So the statement that I'm going to use here is a statement that should be familiar for all of you, is that in Java, every class type that you define will be a subclass of a class. Is this true or not? You know it's true, but can you prove this in terms of mathematics? Well, you can keep running the code and then you can prove me after 1,000 times that that's true, but how can you come up with a proof? Uh, you can say that uh, in the language, well, in the language of uh, Java, every every type, every class is uh, uh, a subtype of uh, of uh, object, uh, and that is in the in the core of the language. Maybe I, so. <laughs> So you know this is true because it's reading in the specs, yeah. right? Oracle has written this in the core of the language, but how can you come up with a mathematical formula that proves this? Are you sure that people didn't make a mistake? So that's the idea, I mean, this, this probably sounds, looks very obvious, but again, give me a proof. And it's interesting to think about that because sometimes you have a friend who likes another language, maybe Clojure, I don't know, what else, and sometimes you fall into small discussions like, hey, I think Clojure is better than Java. And then you come up, why? Can you prove that? I think, uh, that's classical. I think Clojure, I, I think Scala type system is much better than Java type system. Why? Can you prove that? So what's the idea of better? So that's, you know, that's the idea of type theory. Uh, once you make a statement, can you prove it? And that's why I think that's relevant. Not, it's not only because some, somebody wrote in the specs, but can I prove that? So you can come up with way more complex statements. During this talk, I'm going to use this statement because I know you know this is true. And I wanna show you how you build mathematics based on something that you're all familiar, right? 
so let's try to sketch a mathematical expression. Let's call um, class as zeta, this Greek letter. Um, let's call the environments as whole. Uh, and let's call, let's define something called cl class relation, uh, subclass or the class itself, right? So the class itself or, um, or the, the subclass. Uh, so let's try to build a sentence. In an environment, we can prove that a class of a certain type is a subclass of another type or the other type itself. That's the same thing as saying that uh, in Java for every class that you define, there's always um, a superclass, right? Or the class itself is going to be object. Um, we are getting there. Does it make this, 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 this mathematical expression make some sense? In an environment whole, we can prove that a class of a certain type, we call this, I don't know, type one, is the subclass of another class, this type two, or the class itself, right? Uh, we're almost there. We can almost read this, that looks very complex, but actually it's not. So let's try to split this weird expression and show smaller pieces. So, we know this is true, right? Because there is a valid type in an environment. So this is true. Either the type you defined or either the type already exists and it's object, for example. Uh, and this is the superclass of a type. Uh, but this, the, sup, the superclass is also a superclass of another type, right? Does it make sense? So we have a class, which is a superclass, but this is also a superclass of another type. So that's why we can replace, sorry, we can replace this for this other statement here. You have a type, an, another type here, which is also a superclass of another type. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. We, th that's very obvious. But we are trying to turn this uh, statement into mathematics. Uh, and then we are almost there. Can you see that we have a repetition of uh, symbols? We have this type 2, but we know that type 2 is also a subclass of another type. So we can actually turn this into a shorter term, right? Because we are saying the same thing twice. For a certain type, this is either a subclass of another one or the class itself. So we can actually make it, make it a little bit shorter, right? Oops. Uh, and then we can generalize this, the subclass chain, uh, and choose something like that. So I don't know if they step from here to the other one is clear. But you are saying the same thing. So in an environment, we have a certain type that is the class itself or a subclass of another type. And that's true. That's a valid type. This is, you have true and true here. So this statement is true. You just came up with a formula that proves, in terms of, in terms of logic, predicate logic, that what people wrote in the paper makes sense, there is no contradiction here, right? In terms of predicate logic. Uh, so this is true. Uh, and again, why is this important? I know that reading the specs should be a reliable thing. But for us, as software developers, it's also important to have a mechanism to check if the specs are true. Because in our daily basis, we are reading specs from a customer, right? And we are trying to turn that into code. So maybe we can start identifying uh, things that are not true in the specs even before writing the code. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be interesting to have such tool? Maybe. Uh, so again, uh, another thing that I've noticed is uh, I'll, I'll show you a piece of code. And you tell me if this piece of code compiles or not. Can you see that? 
make it a little bit. Can you read that? Does it compile? So what, what would you do? You probably would open your laptop and write this small block of code and check if it compiles or not, right? But do you have to run your program to make sure it's fine or there's a bug? Sometimes you do that, but should you do that? Do you want to have the bug in production? So a thing that type theory also helps to prevent is the number of runtime errors. Does it compile? Who thinks it compiles? Who thinks it doesn't compile? Who thinks nothing? I want GIFs. Um, this actually compiles. Yay! But I have a runtime exception. How do you solve that? Well, generics solved this issue, but this actually compiles and throws a runtime error. So sometimes even Java, who has a strong type system, is not that reliable because this thing compiles and it shouldn't. It's counterintuitive, right? But it compiles. Um, so type theory can actually help you to reduce the number of runtime errors. Because if you get this block of code and if you turn it into a logical statement, you're going to see that you have a contradiction in your uh, logical statement. And you know that that thing is not going to compile. Um, so type theory actually helps lots of IDs uh, to perform a better uh, analysis check. So sometimes you're writing the code and the ID, if you use an ID, the ID is already yelling at you that, sometime, that something is wrong, right? So type theory is a tool that the ID is also used uh, to perform a better checking. Uh, and I think it's an interesting tool to use if you're trying to compare different languages as well. That's why this session starts asking you how do you choose a programming language uh, because with type theory, you can come up with mathematics, and mathematics is difficult to, th th this is a very precise tool to say if something exists or not, or if something is correct or not, right? So we can actually try to compare different languages. Um, and again, you have you know, a solid point to make your own statements about a certain language. So I think, one of the challenges of type theory is finding equivalence between the languages. Uh, this mapping that I did for Java, for example, uh, is not universal. Uh, you can find five or six different uh, PhD theses analyzing Java type system, and each of, each of them com comes up with a different representation for Java type system, for example. That's a challenge. Uh, and sometimes there's no direct equivalence between Java and Clojure or Java or Scala. Uh, so that, that's also, you know, complicated. And even for um, people who are in academia, they don't have a consensus of, you know, how to compare to different languages. Um, type theory is also important uh, to help you to uh, collect uh, the characteristics that actually matter to your project. And then uh, you can come up with a deeper analysis of the language that you chose for that particular project. Um, and again, uh, I've seen lots of discussions like, is everything immutable here? So immutability, it looks like it's a trending topic for several languages, but uh, with type theory, you can actually come up with you know, something solid to prove that if everything is immutable in a certain language or if it's not, or to prove other things like to have covariance or is everything an object? So again, uh, mathematics, uh, seems to be a good tool in order to provide solid discussions for programmers. You know? um, some challenges that I see in type theory, um, again, like I said, there is no uniform way to describe a type system because you can come up with different groupings. Uh, in the end of this presentation, there are going to be five links of PhD thesis and people representing the Java type system in very distinct ways. You're, you're going to be surprised if you open them and check them. Um, it's a lot of mathematics, so lots of people are scared of this topic. They shouldn't, uh, but you know, 
Mathematics sometimes can be scary, especially if there is no soft introduction to the topic. Uh, and I guess that's challenging because 100% of the books that I, that I have read about type theory start with logical expressions and they do not provide you a humanized way to get into the topic. Um, and again, like we are developers on a daily basis. We are probably building you know, web interfaces or mobile apps or things like that. And it requires some time to actually come up with these statements, come up with formal proofs and things like that. So the knowledge required here is kind of extensive, but it's not, not impossible. Right. Those are the, the, the main four theses, uh, each of them coming with a different representation for um, the Java type system. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, some final notes here. Don't be scared. Uh, you were able to come up through a proof about a Java statement of sub, uh, subclasses. Uh, and that wasn't the most difficult thing that you've done in your lives, I guess. Uh, so we can make it. Um, there are several active researchers in type theory, uh, but even if you don't have a PhD, uh, you can still use, of, use some of these concepts. Um, another thing to understand, most of the type theory content is actually focused on Haskell or Camel because they're uh, pure functional languages, but you can use some of these concepts for languages like Java or C++ or whatever, and uh, come up with uh, logic statements about the language. You're not restricted to pure functional languages. Uh, the only difference is that Lambda Calculus, for example, is not going to work for all of the languages, but you can still use the concepts to come up with um, a type system mapping, for example. Uh, here are some references. Uh, this, is, uh, this is also a type system representation for Java, uh, but it compares this with Scala. Uh, but this is not a PhD thesis, that's a blog post. Um, those are some interesting books about it. Again, uh, those books, uh, I think they have a rich content, but my criticism to them is like they are for academics. They're pe from people from academia to people to academia. Um, I also made different versions of this, this session. Uh, they're actually very different. Uh, there is one session that I've, that I've performed at, at Open Source Bridge in Portland in the United States. Uh, and at the session, I explain a little bit more about Lambda Calculus. Uh, so special thanks for Jay Focal's team. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope you had a great time. And I hope you all can understand a little bit more about type theory. And I think that's not as challenging as it appears to be. So do you have time for questions? We have seven minutes for questions. Do you have any questions? Any questions? What's your favorite Pokemon? Anything? Right. Uh, how do you argument, uh, or how, how would you talk to people uh, about dynamic and static languages? I mean, yeah. So I have this slide here, and I think that's soft. That usually doesn't cause any, any sort of disagreement about static and dynamic languages. Yeah, here. So what I usually do, I use this um, analogy. Uh, so for static, um, the compiler actually tags pieces of your code. For a dynamic language like Python, uh, the interpreter actually generates more code to evaluate what you've done. That's the difference. There is no tag. You have extra code to analyze something that you, that you have written. I think that's the most impartial way to describe um, static and dynamic for a more generalized way. Because you are sure that for a static language like Java or like Rust, for example, uh, you have tags. You don't have extra code being generated. That's, for me, that's the best analogy. Does it solve your question? Right. Any other questions? Uh, many years ago, I used a programming language called Tickle, and it only had one type, as far as I remember, was string. Um, it sounds strange, 
but how does it fit in, in that strategy thing? I mean, is, is it correct? Tickle hit just string, is it right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> you have any idea? I'm just wondering. Well, I don't know the language, and I don't know what they do for handling errors. Do they handle errors at all? Any type of errors? Because if they handle one error, that's not untyped. One single error. Even if it's like you, you are trying to type a string without the, um, without, yeah, the quote. So th there is one error. So assembly, for example, doesn't have any type of error. You have to write and run. And that's your own risk. So that's different. So even if they have some sort of syntactic error, they have some error handling. Uh, and if I had to guess, uh, is it compiled? No. Is it interpreted? So probably something weak and dynamic. Probably, if I had to guess. Any other questions? Well, I'll be a oh, there's. A how, how would you class a language like Ada in this hierarchy? Uh, I'm not familiar with Ada. Is it compiled? I think it is. It is compiled and you can uh, create, you, you, you build the types when you program. Uh, it's very strict. It actually has a when you start the application, it has an elaboration stage where it builds the types and somehow try to keep track of whether you break anything. And then it uh, also tracks the types during execution that you're not, if you, the standard uh, example is weekday, one to seven, and it's a specific type and you cannot, that you create when you program, and you cannot assign a variable of that type the value of eight, for instance, then the program will crash. So if I had to guess, uh, it's something strong and static. It sounds like that. Uh, so, but again, uh, what do you think C, are you familiar with C language? How do you classify C? There's the silence. Probably wrong, but I would say strong and static. So there is no consensus about strong and weak in C because in C everything is an integer, and sometimes or most of the times, what C tries to do it's transforming this piece of data in integers. So there is no consensus if it's weak or strong. You can find both answers. So again, like for one language, sometimes you have some divergence. And that's one of the challenges of trying to classify a type of a system. So I guess we're running out of time. Um, I'll be around today. So if you have any further questions or if you want to trade Pokemon, I'll be available. Thank you very much. <laughs>